All right, this lecture will be going over nutrition and in infancy. So this lecture is going to seem like a bit of a review from life cycle. And so for the most part, a lot of this information should look familiar. Um, again, we're talking about a little bit about disease states, but again, for the most part, this is going to look pretty similar to the lecture you've had in life cycle. So infancy includes the first two years of life, which is a time period of rapid physical and social growth. So we use growth charts to assess weight, height, and head circumference. And so the baby's birth weight is determined by their length of gestation, mother's pre-pregnancy weight, and mother's weight gain during gestation. So a little bit of physiology background. So infants will lose approximately 6% of their body weight during the first few days of life, but birth weight is usually regained by the seventh to 10th day. So again, especially in the form of fluid loss. So again, what they're gonna have is a lot of fluid loss in the form of evaporation from the skin. But again, they typically regain the weight fairly quickly once mom's milk comes in. So birth weight's doubled by four to six months and birth weight is typically tripled by the first year. So the amount of weight gain during the second year is approximately equal to birth weight. Um, and so what that's telling us, right, is that weight is, so it tripled in the first year and then it only went up in essence like another 30% the second year. So it's much slower and much, much more linear pattern the second year. Length is increased by 50% during the first year and doubled by four years of age. So total body fat increases rapidly during the first nine months and then tapers off throughout childhood. And so in essence, right, when babies are in that first nine months of life, they look like nice, cute, chunky, roly polies. Um, basically all they do is eat, sleep, occasionally roll around. Um, but right while they're still figuring out their mobility, right? So what they do is they get chunkier and chunkier as they should, which is good and healthy. And then that kind of starts to lean out from there. So total body water decreases throughout infancy from 70% at birth to 60% at one year. And the stomach capacity is approximately 10 to 20 mils at birth and approximately 200 mils by the first year. So the kidneys are still immature at birth and increase in size and concentrating ability in the early weeks of life, which makes sense. We see that newborn babies, of course, pee a lot. And then what we also have to take a look at when we, why we have to provide them the formulas that we do, right, is the baby's kidneys cannot handle the protein loads, which is why we can't give babies milk, etc. So energy requirements, so full-term infants fed standard formula generally adjust intake to meet their energy needs. And we'll carefully monitor gains in length weight, head circumference, and weight for length. But if growth rate decreases or ceases, then we'll investigate. But for the most part, right, babies will auto-regulate, which is if they need more calories, they'll eat more. If they need less calories, they'll eat less. So here we can see the mean rates of weight gain for boys and girls. Um, so this number, this chart's fairly famous. Uh, so again, you should be familiar with this chart. Um, like I said, I have 28 grams per day from the boys chart ingrained in my head or a, a 935 grams a month, which is just shy of one kilo, only because I always think about just how jealous bodybuilders are of babies. Because if you could gain 2.2 pounds or 935 grams, which is about two pounds of muscle a month or tissue a month, um, you'd be an amazing bodybuilder. And yet every baby on planet Earth does it, right? which is it's just wild to me. So like the, the growth rates, like I said, these charts are fair game for the RD exam. I'm personally not going to ask you about them for our exam, um, but realize these could be on the RD exam. Here you can see the equations for predicting resting energy expenditure from body weight. So again, here our focus is on the, the zero to three for this lecture. Um, obviously, we talk about the other lectures, we can see the other age ranges. But again, you can see, so again, a little bit simpler formula where again, we're just going off of total weight. Again, we're not looking at gender or length. And so again, we can just see, so it's a little bit more zoomed in so you can see the World Health Organization. Now this is the RDA. So again, another method to determine calorie needs for infants. Again, this chart is famous and is fair game for the RD exam. And so again, you'll see this is kind of the highest we ever see in a healthy state for, so for calories and protein, that infancy is kind of the highest any human will ever need. So remember that for normal people, you're 25 to 30 calories per kilogram. These infants are eating 108 calories per kilogram, or in essence, more than triple 
what you are eating. So imagine what a normal human eats, and then triple it, and that's the equivalent of what a baby is doing every day for the first six months of life. And again, you can see protein. So again, you saw how much tissue they were building and how fast they were growing. So again, they are extremely anabolic and can use protein much more efficiently um, than any bodybuilder wishes they could. So the protein requirements for infants are extremely high per kilogram when compared to children and adults, but the total amount is very low because their body weight is very low. So the amount of, human, uh, the amount of protein in human milk is significantly less when compared to formula, and so at age 6 to 12 months, breast milk is recommended to be supplemented with additional sources of protein, and these are typically the first foods that many children eat, which are going to be fortified cereals, strained meats, and yogurt. And again, the biggest thing is we want to make sure that we are mixing formula according to directions, as if we are diluting it, it may not contain adequate protein to support growth. For fat, we recommend 30 grams per day for infants less than one year of age. Both human milk and formula contain sufficient quantities of fat, and human milk does contain the essential fatty acids linoleic and alpha-linolenic. Again, this is in very low concentrations, but is adequate right for the size of the infant. And human milk does contain ARA and DHA, and formula should be supplemented with EFAs, ARA and DHA, right? So nowadays in standard formulas, this is going to be included as a supplement. So linoleic is essential for growth and should supply approximately 3% of total energy intake. For carbohydrates, we want approximately 30 to 60% of calories during infancy to come from carbohydrates. We do want to avoid honey and corn syrup in children less than one year of age, as the product may contain spores and so infants don't have the developed immune system required to resist botulism development, which would then lead to botulinum poisoning. Um, and so it is possible, right, for infants to be lactose intolerant, um, but it's, it's typically very rare as this wouldn't show up commonly until two years of age um, when weaning would normally occur and lactase enzyme production decreases. For water needs, human milk and properly prepared formula should provide adequate amounts of water. The exception to this is in hot, humid environments, especially, for example, if you're actually outside. So I know what you're thinking, which is Florida is a hot, humid environment, right? It's in the mid-90s, but we spend all of our time in air conditioning. So if you live inside in air conditioning, you're not going to need the additional water. If you didn't have electricity or if you were outside for long periods of time in a hot, humid environment, it would be different. So for infants, we're going to monitor the number of wet diapers to assess hydration. So again, babies should have four to six wet diapers a day. Again, our concern is hyper and hyponatremia. So again, excessive or inadequate hydration. Again, we don't want to replace formula with water and we don't want to dilute formula unless directed to do so by a, a, pedi a pediatrician. Again, because the, it could be diluted depending on nutrition needs. But again, we would want guidance on that. We would not want to do this on our own. So here we have a table for looking at fluid needs for pediatric patients. So again, looking at the body weight, it's usually typically going to be the first row for infants, which is 3 to 10 kilograms, right? And so then not until much later when we're really approaching uh, childhood that we're going to be looking at the next two rows. And here you can see a little bit different diagram. So again, it's a little bit more detail. So for that first year of life, we have at 10 days, 3 months, 6 months, and then up to 1 year. For minerals, so fluoride, so human milk is very low in fluoride and may need to supplement or use fluoridated water after six months. So again, this would be in supplemental foods. Iron, so breast infants should receive an additional source of iron by four to six months of age. Cow's milk is a poor source of iron. And while human milk is actually lower in iron than cow's milk even, but the iron that it does contain is more bioavailable and absorbable. But commonly the first foods that most infants eat is a cereal, so whether this is typically things like your cream of rice, and again, these are going to be iron fortified. Chronic iron deficiency is correlated with long-term developmental deficits and behavioral issues in early adolescence. For vitamins, for B12, breast milk may be deficient if mother is a strict vegan. Otherwise, there should be adequate quantities in breast milk. For vitamin D, human milk contains adequate amounts of all vitamins except vitamin D. 
and breastfeed infants require at least 400 international units daily, and children may develop rickets if they're deficient in vitamin D. Now, there are other options, um, so extensive breastfeeding um, in, in basically in front of a window, et cetera. Um, but again, the easiest solution is their vitamin D drops. Vitamin K, so hospitals provide a vitamin K injection at birth to ensure needs are met immediately after birth. A deficiency may result in bleeding or hemorrhagic disease, so especially if the baby's injured, uh, rolls off of a surface earlier than expected, etc. And so again, this makes sense because remember, we get most of our vitamin K from a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in our GI tract, but when babies are born, they have a sterile GI tract with no bacteria. So again, here you can see a summary of the micronutrient recommendations for supplementation for infants. So again, for supplementation, so formula-fed infants rarely need supplements as the nutrients that were previously discussed will actually be fortified into the supplement. Breast infants, again, we said are going to need vitamin D shortly after birth with iron at four to six months or a fortified food such as cereal. And so what you'll commonly see, so is polybisol with iron. So again, this is basically an, an infant's vitamin. Um, so it doesn't contain the same spectrum that you would see in like an adult centrum. Um, it actually contains much fewer vitamins in different forms. Again, for better absorption, no competition, and you're really just supplementing what infants need. So human milk is the food of choice for the infant. So the composition is designed to provide the appropriate energy and nutrients in the appropriate amounts and we get additional benefits. So in addition to the macronutrients, benefits include that it contains immune factors that help support and strengthen the immature immune system. It's easily digestible and highly bioavailable. Breastfeeding seems to reduce the incidence of diarrhea and otitis media, which is ear infections. Allergic reactions to human milk are incredibly rare and breastfeeding enhances bonding between mother and baby. And of course it has economic benefits as it is uh, in essence, free. Now, again, there is some cost with storage, pumping, etc. Or if mom is then taking time off, so there might be some economic difference if mom is having to spend full time with the baby. But essentially, it's much cheaper in cost than formula. So colostrum is the clear yellowish fluid in human milk during, the, and it's not technically truly milk, but um, so it comes from the breast in the first few days of life to meet the infant's needs during the first week. So it actually has a different nutrient composition. So it contains less fat and carbohydrates, but more protein, and contains higher concentrations of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And it's an excellent source of immunological substances. And so the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Academy of Pediatrics both recommend breastfeeding for the first six months of life, and then breastfeeding supplemented with complementary foods. Uh, up until 12 months. Now the reason why that matters is that the World Health Organization actually says it's perfectly fine for breastfeeding up until two years of age. So human milk does contain antibodies and anti-infective factors that are not present in formula, so they just really can't be replicated. So we have secretory immunoglobin A, and this plays a role in protecting the immature gut from infection, and so breastfed infants should uh, be breastfed for at least three months to obtain these benefits. And lactoferrin is an iron binding protein in human milk that deprives bacteria of iron and thus slows the growth. And this goes back to when we talked about our metabolically stressed patients with sepsis, where again, we wanna make sure that we do not provide them with iron in septic patients, because again, bacteria thrives when it has access to iron. Human milk also contains lysozymes. So these destroy the cell membranes of bacteria after peroxides and ascorbic acid in human milk have deactivated them. Human milk enhances the growth of lactobacillus bifidus, which produces the acidic GI environment, which again, through competition, protects from infections. And the incidence of infections is lower in breastfed infants than in formula-fed infants. So let's take a quick look at the proteins that are in breast milk as well as formula. So we're gonna talk about whey versus casein. So whey is easier to digest. It is the preferred protein for preemies. And so on the next slide, we'll actually talk about that ratio. And is also involved in the use of supplements for premature infants. Casein can irritate the GI tract and cause GI bleeds or anemia. And too much casein can cause, again, the formation of curves, which can lead to obstruction. And there are less allergies associated with the whey protein. 
So whole milk versus breast milk slash formula. And so these numbers you do need to memorize. So breast milk contains 20 calories per ounce on average. Um, so it actually does fluctuate during the day. So um, there are periods of time where it actually contains more fluid and there's periods of time where it actually contains less fluid and more calories. But the, the gold standard, the average is 20 calories per ounce with a ratio of weight to casein of 60, 40. And so what you'll see is 70, 30 is that if a baby is born prematurely, mom's body will actually adjust and change the protein ratio and concentration and actually increase the amount of whey in mom's breast milk. Cow's milk, in comparison, is about 18.6 calories per ounce and has a excessively high renal solute load. So it contains more protein and mineral content than breast milk. So used in place of breast milk can lead to renal failure and dehydration. And again, in essence, the ratio is inverse, right? Where there's only 20% whey and 80% casein in cow's milk. So it doesn't contain enough vitamins and minerals to support human growth. It is low in iron and not enough fat with 2% or skim and not enough essential fatty acids. So cow's milk is not recommended until the first year of age. And so again, cow's milk contains 20% of its total energy from protein, whereas human milk, only 6 to 7% of its total energy is from protein. So again, this is what contributes to the higher renal solute load. Also, when we take a look at the osmolality of human milk, is approximately 300 milliosmoles per kilogram, and cow's milk is approximately 400 milliosmoles per kilogram. Now again, from an NIH study, and again, those numbers are averages. So in this study, they found the average of 273 milliosmoles per breast milk. Infant formula was 180 to 300. Whole milk was 389. Goat's milk at 339. Give you an example though, k syrup was at 2,198. Fruit juice somewhere between 257 to 1152. And cola 479 to 811. So if we are going to use formulas, so again, we talked about those protein sources previously. We talked a little bit about whey and casein, but some other things to consider. So formulas can be cow's milk or soy based. So again, we can supplement human milk with formula depending on if there's lactation issues, um, cost issues, convenience issues, uh, right again, or if there's latching issues, etc. So the FDA does regulate infant formula manufacturing. Um, and so this is a big thing, actually, is the facilities that can manufacture it. So there were some issues with melamine poisoning. So we go back to the renal chapter. So there were issues some with melamine poisoning with imported formula from China. Um, so now the FDA does strictly regulate infant formula production. So there's been additions and changes to the formula over the years to more closely mimic human milk, including DHA, ARA, and the addition of pre and probiotics. <clears throat> There's been a decline in anemia in infants due to iron-fortified formulas. So we will talk about, so casein hydrosylate is used for hypoallergenic formulas, which is for infants who have protein allergies to milk. What we actually do is we take casein and hydrosylate it or break it down, and we use that. Now, even though they're still allergic to milk, how are we using a milk protein broken down? Which I agree is very counterintuitive, um, but a student asked me a few cores ago and so we did a pretty deep dive into the research and in essence um, we don't do a whole lot of experimental studies in infants and so what they simply found was this works so keep using it. Another option is soy based formulas. So with soy based formulas infants are exposed to several thousand times higher levels of phytoestrogens and isoflavone levels. The effects of this on long-term infant development is not yet clear. It's also not recommended for preterm infants due to increased risk of osteopenia, as phytates in the formula can bind with minerals and interfere with their absorption in an already at-risk population. Soy-based formulas are fortified with additional minerals, but still presents with an increased risk of osteopenia. The aluminum levels in soy formula exceed those in human milk. Although it does meet the FDA guidelines for total content, it is noted that this is much higher than human milk. Now, formula does come packaged in three different forms. So we have ready to feed, which requires no preparation, no mixing or adding water necessary, but it's extremely expensive. We have liquid concentrate, which comes in 12 ounce cans or jars. So this is 40 calories per ounce undiluted. 
we mix this with 12 ounces of water. So again, you would have 12 ounces of water, 12 ounces of formula in a one to one ratio to make 21, I'm sorry, to make 20 calorie per one ounce formula. And so one can should last approximately uh, three fourths to one day. And then the most cost effective option is powder with one scoop of powder to every two ounces of water to again make 20 calorie per ounce formula and one can should last approximately three to four days. So here you can see an example of the products. So again, you can see the ready to use versus the powder versus the concentrate. Now there are other specialty formulas. These include those that are soy-based, lactose-free, elemental, so they're made of just amino acids, metabolic formulas, which remove specific amino acids. So again, if somebody has a problem with just digesting phenylalanine because they have PKU, then again, right, that's a metabolic formula. There's also hypoallergenic formulas. So again, this is going to be formulas that have hydrolyzed casein for any allergies. And then also, again, we previously talked about is human milk fortifier, which again is kind of like a, um, a crystal light packet, which is added to formula to increase or breast milk to increase its density of nutrients. So formula preparation. So we do not prepare, we do not prepare, we do not prepare formula in the microwave. So formula needs to be in a water bath. Now there are now some techniques. I know that I've seen the bottle steamers, which is kind of like a water bath, but they're for very short periods of time. Now again, we want to make sure that we're using clean water, so boiling the water for one to two minutes if using tap water, or use bottled or distilled water. And so if boiling, obviously you have to uh, so measure after it's heated and cooled. So, so you boil the water and then let it cool. So again, this is making sure that the water is clean and free of germs. So formula may be prepared for a 24 hour period and kept refrigerated, but discard any formula that has been warmed and not consumed. So it can be kept cold, but once it's heated up, it needs to be either consumed or thrown away. So how do we get a diet history for an infant? So again, you're going to obviously not be able to ask the patient. So you're going to ask the parent or caregiver. And these are the questions we ask for formula. What type of formula? How do you make or prepare the formula? And then it's kind of a combo, but I know it's technically two questions, but how much and how often? So again, what brand? How did you mix it? And then how much and how often? If the baby's breastfed, we're going to ask how often do they breastfeed? How long do they breastfeed on each side? And then how many wet and soiled diapers does the baby have? Now transitioning, so again, after the first year of life. So infants should not be fed cow's milk prior to one year of age. So cow's milk, again, we can, we know it causes a small amount of GI blood loss. Also, higher levels of protein, sodium and potassium with inadequate iron and linoleic acid. So again, we don't give cow's milk until after one year of age. Now from one to two, low fat and non-fat milk are inappropriate choices. We want to avoid rice, oat, and nut milks prior to one year. Again, many of these contain very low nutrient content, so they're not a very good substitute. And then transitioning to whole milk at one year. So from, from zero to one, no cow's milk. From one to two, whole milk. After two years of age, we can then transition to 2% or nonfat. So the big thing is, is that, so from zero to one, no milk, and then from one to two, Children still need a very large number of calories, and the easiest way to obtain that right in their diet is going to be through a higher fat concentration. Again, foods we talked about, so infant cereal is typically the first food, and these are almost always fortified with iron. Strained fruits and vegetables, which again are going to be good sources of vitamin A and C. And so again, strained fruits and vegetables, I don't know if anybody actually still uses food mills or you can use them. Um, compress things through a sieve, but nowadays I know everybody's got the bullets and does it's a lot easier to make homemade baby food. So you want to introduce one food at a time for a two to seven day interval to assess for allergies. You want to 
encourage vegetable intake before fruits. So again, of course, babies like vegetables. They're sweet and delicious. Okay, they eat vegetables. So once you've had fruits, why would you want to eat vegetables? But if I get you used to eating vegetables and you like vegetables, then it's very likely that you'll then consume fruits as well. Strained meats, right, or pureed meats are going to be a good source of protein and iron. There are dessert items like sugar, tapioca, or cornstarch. Again, just for additional calories and pleasure, not really for a lot of nutrients. Um, again, you can buy organic. Um, at the amount consumed by infants, it's not that big of a concern. Um, you can also prepare it at home, so again, with proper guidelines. And so if you want to prepare infant food at home, again, this is the time to be more picky on the quality of your fruits and vegetables. Make sure everything's clean, not cross-contaminated. Again, washing and trimming the produce. So again, we're going to cook it until tender and as little water as possible, so we don't want to overcook it and destroy any of the micronutrients. Again, babies don't need any salt or sugar. They don't have any preferences. They just need to taste the fruits and vegetables. So again, a little bit of water to make sure that it's pureed and then strain it. So you can use a food mill, a nin Nutribullet, a Ninja, etc. And then the easiest thing to do is actually just put it in an ice cube mold. And so then basically you have individualized portions. So then you remove those and put those in freezer bags. And then you just heat up one, small, one or two ice cubes or quote unquote ice cubes of baby food at a time. So here you can see a feeding chart. So again, at different ages, what they should be consuming and in sample portions. Now again, the other big one is a focus on, so breastfeeding support. So especially in newborn babies, it's very difficult. So we'll talk more about this during the Q&A session, but we kind of skipped a generation with breastfeeding. So breastfeeding has now had a big resurgence. So a lot of us were formula fed because post-World War II, we kind of convinced moms to go to work, not be at home. So then we had to find an alternative. So we introduced formula. Then we then discovered that from a scientific standpoint, breastfeeding is better. So it's now had a resurgence, but there's some of those missing skills or there's that generation gap of trying to communicate with patient families. So again, we want to make sure that patients are getting adequate support. So again, initial feedings every two to three hours. And so every four hours by two months of age and by three to four months, you usually can omit night feedings. It's not that you're not, you can, you, if you want to be up with the baby, you can, but they're not, it's not needed, right? The biggest thing is that babies initially eat frequently because of their metabolisms and their blood sugars. By three to four months, this is much better controlled. And we've talked a little bit about BPA or bisphenol A. So this is a chemical in plastic that may have an effect on brain behavior and prostate gland in infants. Um, and so research is ongoing, but we actually, so we've removed BPA now. So the biggest concern, for example, was using water baths and bottle steamers. So getting that plastic heated up repeatedly is when BPA actually became more dangerous. So like in water bottles that we would all bring to class to drink water during class, um, it's not nearly as big of a concern, but when you're actually getting the bottle hot multiple times, um, then it can be a bit of a concern. So here you can see satiety behavior. So again, this is going to require education to the family members. And so again, right, so babies aren't able to say I'm full, so instead they have specific behaviors. So miscellaneous, so we want to limit juice to no more than four to six ounces per day. And so should be given by a sippy cup, so not in a bottle. Again, we don't want to, it damages the children's teeth. Um, although it is now okay to just recommend no juice. Failure to thrive may occur if juice replaces nutrient-dense foods. We want to encourage infants to feed themselves. So, of course, there's a period of time where you have to feed your children. Like, don't, don't be crazy. Um, but what we want, right, we want them to develop that dexterity, develop their grip, their strength, their hand muscles. So we actually want them to start feeding themselves as soon as possible, developing their pincer grip with their index finger and thumb. So, again, cutting food into small pieces for them, though. Again, we don't force children to eat, and again, provide a variety of textures and flavors. So here we can see again, right, at a certain age, you do have to feed children. But then we see the development of the pincer grip between the index and thumb. Here again, we see, so as children begin using spoons, right, they're going to develop wrist control. But again, they're not perfect. But again, 
right? They want to be able to use a spoon in different methods. So you can see this is a modified spoon. But again, the first thing that children do is the palmer grip where you just you just hold everything in your palm just like a, like you're going to stab something with an ice pick, right? That kind of grip. Um, and again, you start to you learn how to hold things differently, your different utensils, and then move your wrist, etc. All right, so let's, let's take a look at some practice questions. So weight gain in formula-fed infants is generally, and this is going to be actually A, greater than in breastfed infants. So again, the act of actually having to um, work for their food, in essence, actually tires them out, and so babies eat less. So you'll see now, so what you'll see now is actually they have a different types of nipples for baby bottles. So the baby actually has to work harder, which again helps encourage that natural satiety. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends a supplemental source of blank in a breastfed infant at six months of age. And so this is going to be protein. So again, we recommend a strained meat. So that is answer choice C, protein. So anti-infective factors in human milk include So this is answer choice D, so lysozymes and IgA. Parents may give their infants cow's milk after age. And this is answer choice D, after 12 months. So after 12 months, we can start whole milk. And number five, Addition of weaning foods to the infant's diet should be based on. And so again, going back to and looking at so that development of the different grips, the use of utensils. So this is going to be answer choice B, developmental readiness and nutrient needs. So again, which micronutrients they need, the fortification of iron, protein, and if those are the correct foods. Thank you and I look forward to your questions.